exposure through John Burroughs' mind back in 1988, eight years after these events. And we're in 2010 and he still doesn't consciously remember what happened to him, even with other people saying that light beams came over him. But what we're going to do now is go back through what was the hard data that we all have as bricks in the foundation of this story. And let's start with the midnight after, after midnight, December 26th. This is the night that John Burroughs and Sergeant Penniston and Ed Kavansack have gone out into Rendlesham Forest to try to find out first what are these odd lights. That was the first audio. And later on, Airman Burroughs submitted a handwritten statement about what he saw to the RAF Bentwaters Deputy Base Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt. And here is an excerpt. This is John's handwriting. It was handwritten on January 2nd, 1981, about the December 26th after midnight event. The lights were red and blue, the red one above the blue one, and they were floating on and off because I never saw anything like that coming from the woods before. We decided to drive down and see what it was. We went down Eastgate Road and took a right at the stop sign and drove down about 10 to 20 yards to where there is a logging road that goes into the forest. At the road, I could see a white light shining onto the trees and I could still see the red and blue lights. This would move back and forth, up and down, but the blue and white and orange would come out. And when it was sitting in one place, blue lights would come out of the beam and the white lights below. Blue lights would blink on and off inside the beam, plus the beam would be red and orange. A white light would come out below the beam in the trees, signed Airman First Class John Burroughs, 81st Security Police Squadron, Security Police Operations, Charlie Flight. John worked with a man named John Rackham in England to try to flesh out in a computer illustration that you're looking at now from his January 2nd, 1981 illustration and notes. Those notes in the illustration are one of the bricks of what we would call the first pieces of documentation and paper trail that we have going all the way back to that time. Now John Burroughs told me that he was overwhelmed with the feeling out there in the forest with Jim Penniston and Ed Kvansack that, quote, something was not right in the air. He and Steffens drove back to the East Gate. They phoned a Sergeant McCabe to report the strange lights and McCabe alerted the Central Security Control. That early morning of December 26, 1980, Staff Sergeant James Penniston was duty supervisor at RAF Woodbridge. So Sergeant Penniston drove to the East Gate in a truck with newly assigned Airman First Class Edward Kavansack to see for himself what was happening. Jim Penniston said after a call to the shift commander's office, he was told to proceed off base. This is now going off the base onto civilian UK property toward the mysterious lights with the two other security policemen, John Burroughs and Ed Kavansack. The three American men were told to leave their weapons behind to comply with the British military status forces agreement. In that 88 hypnosis session, John is saying that Penniston is saying fire on it, and John is saying, I can't, I don't have my gun. Back in Sergeant Penniston's truck, the men drove out of the East Gate and onto the logging road that ran through Rendlesham Forest, and Penniston said the road was so full of potholes that they stopped. And then Ed Kavansack walked with Sergeant Penniston and Airman Burroughs into the woods until a light rose in the above Rendlesham trees. And John says the light was suddenly so bright that it made them all hit the ground in a military trained reaction is this something that's going to explode? What is it? They all hit the ground. And whatever it was started moving back toward the open field. After that, there was a lot of radio interference and it was decided according to Sergeant Penniston 
that Kavansak should stay with the truck to relay communications while Penniston and Burroughs continue walking toward the lights. And Penniston was responsible for guiding this orange path in this particular aerial of what the path was going out this you can see where they stopped the vehicle stop and further on toward the farmer's field that orange is the landing site that has been identified at least for a long time as related to the events on the 26th. John Burroughs and Sergeant Penniston also describe feeling physically the hair on their arms and the back of their neck and their head stood up like a thunderstorm's electrostatic atmosphere. But it was a clear, cold night. There were no storms. According to Penniston's notebook shown here and his official written report, he and Airman John Burroughs got close to a highly strange craft on the ground. Penniston said, quote, triangular in shape, the top portion is producing mainly white light, which encompasses most of the upper section of the craft. A small amount of white light is appearing from what appears to be the bottom of the craft. At the left side is a bluish light, and on the other side is red light. The light seemed to be molded as part of the exterior of the structure that seemed to be landed on the forest floor." Close quote. Strangely, John Burroughs to this day does not remember seeing Jim Penniston near such a craft. But Burroughs also knows that his mind is blocked when he thinks about the lights. John Burroughs also does not remember Sergeant Penniston having a camera. But Penniston says that he took 36 photographs on 35 millimeter black and white film and sketched symbols in his notebook that were engraved into the craft's shiny black surface that he compared for me to onyx, black solid onyx. This computer graphic that was produced in uh, the help of uh, John Burroughs and U UK researcher John Rackham of what John does remember seeing in the forest is not a, an airplane crashing, it is not the planet Mars, and it is definitely not the Orford Ness Lighthouse. And what we know for certain is that the Sea Flight Shift Commander, Lieutenant Fred Buran, talked to Staff Sergeant James Penniston, Airman First Class John Burroughs, and Airman Ed Kavansak after the Sea Flight Shift was over at 7 a.m. on December 26, 1980. And here is Lieutenant Buran's own summary statement. This was written on the date, you can see, January 2, 1981. Quote, at approximately 0300 hours, 26 December 1980, I was on duty at building 679 Central Security Control when I was notified that Airman First Class Burroughs had sighted some strange lights in the wooded area east of the runway at RAF Woodbridge. Shortly after this initial report, Airman First Class Burroughs was joined by Staff Sergeant Penniston and his rider, Airman Kavansak. Staff Sergeant Penniston also reported the strange lights I directed Staff Sergeant Coffey, the on-duty security controller, to attempt to ascertain from Staff Sergeant Penniston whether or not the lights could be marker lights of some kind, to which Sergeant Penniston said that he had never seen lights of this color or nature in the area before. He described them as red, blue, white, and orange. Sergeant Penniston requested permission to investigate. After he had been joined by the security flight chief, Master Sergeant Chandler, and turned his weapon over to him. I directed them to go ahead. Sergeant Penniston had previously informed me that the lights appeared to be no further than 100 yards from the road east of the runway. I monitored their progress as they entered the wooded area. They appeared to get very close to the lights and at one point Sergeant Penniston stated that it was a definite mechanical object. Due to the colors they had reported, I alerted them to the fact that they may have been approaching a light aircraft crash scene. I directed Sergeant Coffey to check with the tower to see if they could throw some light on the subject, and they could not help. Sergeant Penniston reported getting near the object, and then all of a sudden said that they had gone past it and were looking at a marker beacon that was in the same general direction as the other lights. 
This could be the time that Jim Penniston tells me he knows that he lost at least 45 minutes in the forest. I ask him through Sergeant Coffey if he could have been mistaken, to which Penniston replied that had I seen the other lights, I would know the difference. Sergeant Penniston seemed somewhat agitated at this point. They continued to look further to no avail. At approximately 0354 hours, I terminated the investigation and ordered all units back to their normal duties. I directed Sergeant Penniston to take notes of the incident when he came in that morning. After talking with him face to face concerning the incident, I am convinced that he saw something out of the realm of explanation for him at that time. I would like to state that Sergeant Penniston is a totally reliable and mature individual. He was not overly excited, nor do I think he is subject to overreaction or misinterpretation of circumstances. Later that morning, after conversing with Captain Mike Verano, the day shift commander, I discovered that there had been several other sightings. Any further developments, I have no direct knowledge of, signed Fred A. Baran, 81st Security Police Squadron. Well, what exactly happened next, on what date and time, and in what sequence is still argued about by the people who were there? But for this presentation, I'm going to offer one possible sequence that's based on several interviews that I have done. At 11 p.m. on December 26, 1980, D-Flight was gathering to get their guns in the nightly procedure known as guard mount. One of the new enlistees who had only arrived at RAF Bantwaters two months before in October of 1980 was Lori Bowen, 18 years old, second from the right in the middle row of this D-Flight drill team photograph. Lori grew up in Fridley, Minnesota, and immediately after high school enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. Lori went through basic training at Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, and like all new basic airmen, she was assigned to gates to monitor people coming in and out of gates. Christmas night, December 25th, 1980, she had been at the Woodbridge main gate and remembers base commander Ted Conrad bringing Christmas dinner to her and others that were working the holiday swing shift. Sea Flight was finishing its third midnight shift. That's where John Burroughs and Jim Penniston and Ed Kavansack. And that day of Christmas, D Flight was on swing shift. That means during the day, beginning for three days on the 26th to the 28th, C Flight, John Burroughs' flight, would be off. D flight begins three nights of midnight shift, starting at 11 o'clock on the, in this case, the 26th, and going till 7 a.m. the 27th, and they would do this for three nights. So we have left off C flight officially, and now we're into the world of D flight. And the amazing thing that I have learned is there was no communication whatsoever between the C flight and the D flight group. Those who came on in D flight knew nothing about what had happened in the forest on the 26th. Now, because Lori was a basic airman and she was not given the privilege of driving her own vehicle, Lori Bowen remembers that she's driven from the D-Flight guard mount and dropped off for a midnight shift at the East Gate, which would be after midnight, or that period as midnight goes over into the 27th. And this was not a normal procedure. Usually only swing shifts worked the remote East Gate and left the guard shack around 9 p.m. on those shifts. But the explanation for putting Lori there for the December 26 D flight midnight shift might have been precisely because of the Penniston Burroughs Kavansack dramatic events the night before. Lori said she and others in D flight were not told anything about the mysterious lights that C flight investigated, but apparently those lights and craft were being kept secret under orders from higher authority and that same higher authority would want more eyes and ears on Rendlesham Forest 
in case those lights and a craft came back. And so now, Lori Bowen, 18